be the title of the teaching today is, Are You a Disciple of Christ? And I know what you may be thinking, duh, we're Christians here, James, this is a church, of course we're disciples. Uh, there's, there's many passages that correspond being a disciple with being a Christian, with being a disciple and being saved. Being a disciple has very definite uh, explanations and descriptions in the word. So that's what we're going to look at. But first, before we get into that, I have three questions. I'd like you to raise your hand to these if you say amen to, the, to these questions, to the answer to these things. And here's question number one of number three. Number three questions, here's the first one. How many of you want to live your life in such a way that Jesus Christ uses you to touch as many lives surrounding you and make an impact in the world by the power of God for the glory of God. Kind of see some hands? Oh, yeah, that's like the majority of us. Amen. Awesome. All right, question number two. How many want to see souls saved, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, rescued from sin, death, judgment, and hellfire, and see the kingdom of God expand. You can see some hands. Yeah, they're saying hands, and even more. I know a couple more hands went up. Amen. How many of you, question number three, how many of you want to become more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ? How many? I think almost every hand's going to go up for that one, right? Amen. Amen. All right, well, what needs to happen to bring all this about? We need Jesus. Without Jesus, we can do nothing, right? John 15, 5, with, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we need Jesus. The disciples of Christ are the ones that God is going to use, is using, to accomplish the spiritual purposes in this world. No religion can do it. No political organization can do it. No grassroots movement can do it. No philosophy or psychology of man can do it. The hope of this world can be found only, only in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we, you and I, are stewards of the gospel. We're caretakers for the gospel. God's put the gospel into your hands and says, go and share this good news. So our purpose is as to Christ's disciples are what? What is Christ called us as his disciples to do? Well, I just said so. Preach the gospel. Right? And also make disciples. Uh, Mark chapter 16, beginning with verse 15, it says, And he, that's Jesus, said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. I asked someone in the uh, discipleship class, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, if they could share the gospel. And they did, and they did a very good job. And I noticed it didn't take a lot of time. Sometimes we're a little reluctant to share the gospel uh, with others. You know, we're in the checkout line at the grocery store waiting for a bus, or maybe we're at the laundromat, and, you know, we think, well, I want to share the gospel, but man, you know, I, I just don't have, there's not a lot of time. Well, check this out. I'm going to share the gospel with you, and you just see how long it takes. You can even look at your watch and time if you like. All right? Here it is. We have all sinned and broken God's law, and God, being a holy and just judge, must condemn all crimes against his law and punish sinners. If he refrains from doing so, he wouldn't be who he is holy and just. But, but God so loved the world that He gave us His Son who took God's punishment for our sin. And whoever believes in Jesus and His gospel will not perish but have everlasting life because Jesus conquered over sin, death, hell, and has risen from the grave with victory. All who believes the gospel and repents are from their sin are no longer 
condemned sinners, but they are saved saints, children of God. Amen. Amen. Now, I timed that at home. I probably took a little longer here, but I timed it. It took 47 seconds. In less than one minute, you could share the gospel. Now, that might excite a conversation, all right? And so you're going to have to talk some more. But that is the gospel in a nutshell. So it doesn't take long. If you hop on YouTube and you check out the ministry of Mark Cahill, that's C-A-H-I-L-L, Mark Cahill. He's a very gifted evangelist. And when you watch his videos, he's going to encourage you and teach you how you can share the gospel with others. I have a three DVD set of Mark Cahill where he goes into this. And I've given some of those DVDs out to the congregation. If you'd like a set of these three DVDs uh, by Mark Cahill, see me after service, and I'll go produce them, and I'll bring them back to you uh, totally free of charge. All right? So, that's the, that's the gospel. We're called to preach the gospel. And what else? Well, Matthew 28, 19. There Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you. So, making disciples. Preaching the gospel, when they get saved, they become disciples. And then they are, those disciples are to be taught the, the, the doctrine of God's Word. It's a big book. This isn't going to happen overnight, right? You share the gospel, it can take, like I said, under a minute. Making disciples, that's a lifelong endeavor. I've been a disciple now for uh, a little over 41 years, and I'm still learning. Okay. Amen. So, preaching the gospel and uh, making disciples. Uh, we have a discipleship class every Sunday here at the church, um, 9.15 a.m. to 10 o'clock. Uh, currently, we're having discipleship class on spiritual warfare. We're about halfway through. So you think, yeah, you're halfway through. There's no point in joining. Well, if you want to, come ahead. It doesn't matter. Because, you know, in all the exhortation and teaching that's going on, it's all the Word of God. So if you just come one time, you're going to receive something of God's Word. And you'll be blessed. But uh, once we're done with Discipleship 103, the spiritual warfare, then we're going to get into Discipleship 104, which is apologetics and evangelism. So we'll make an announcement when we get close to that date. And if you want, you can sign up for that. Well, we are called as disciples of Christ to abide in His Word. To abide in His Word. It's the only way that we will know the truth is when we abide in His Word. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed on Him, If you abide in My Word, you are My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So this isn't just head knowledge, that we can know the truth that the Scriptures reveal. This is a truth that transforms us. And changes us. And frees us from God's holy wrath and judgment. Frees us from sin and the condemnation of the devil. Frees us from death and judgment and hellfire. It frees us, liberates us. It frees us and liberates us so that now we can live godly lives in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 1 verses 1 to 2. Also 2 Timothy 3.12 address that. But what does it mean to abide? We don't commonly use that word in today's language. Abide. Well, Jesus, He abides in us when we're born again. But what does it mean to abide in Him and His Word? Well, to abide in, in the Greek, when you look it up in the Greek uh, language, the word they use in the Greek for abide means to dwell in, to make yourself at home, to hang out, is something how we would say, yep. right? right? But more than this, just as you live in your home, we are to live in the Scriptures, right? To make a home for the Word of God in our hearts. 
so that Jesus feels at home in our hearts. Right? That's, that's abiding in Him and in His Word. To make the truth of God's Word our life so that we aren't just reading the Bible. We're not just studying the Bible. We are living the Bible by the very same Spirit of God that Jesus depended on Himself while He was walking this earth. And He, filled with the Spirit of God, demonstrated for us as our supreme example how a godly life is lived. And He had to lean on the Holy Spirit. He could have leaned on His own power. He's God made flesh. He could have done that. But that would have been an example for us because I can't live by my power the way that Jesus can live by His. So he completely leaned on the Holy Spirit. And we as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Can we lean on the Holy Spirit to empower us? Amen. So he's that example for us. Now, a disciple can, a a disciple will and, and does withstand the storms, the trials, the burdens, and the attacks of the enemy. And this is not one who only reads and studies the Bible, but obeys the Word of God. If you see a Christian, and they're going from one defeat after another, and they're struggling, and there's just, there seems to be no victory in their lives. They may be saved, they may be born again and everything, but they're just suffering defeat all over the place, right? They're maybe reading the Bible, but there's a lack of obedience, Because what does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 25? He talks about such a disciple who hears and obeys. That disciple is the one who has his house built on the rock. And when the storms of this life come and they pound that house, they pound it and pound it, and that house remains standing. It will not fall because it is founded on Jesus Christ and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what we want. Say, if you want that spiritual strength and stability, so we obey the Lord. Well, that's a, that's a mark of a disciple. Obedience, right? So what else has Christ called us to as his disciples? John chapter 13, 34 and 35 describes another aspect of what it means to be a disciple. Jesus says there, He doesn't say a a commandment I give you. He says a new commandment I give to you. A new one. Oh, let's here's up, guys. We've got a new commandment. Jesus is going to give it to us. That you love one another. Well, that's all over the Bible, Lord. Well, how's that a new one? Ah, here we go. That you love one another, Jesus says, as I have loved you. Wow. That's how much Jesus loves you. He hung on that cross. He took God's wrath and judgment. He, his suffering went way beyond the physical pain of the cross. Amen. He suffered the entire of God's holy wrath, not just against a few lives, the entire human race. Yes, Can you calculate the amount of judgment for the entire human race and the sin? that they've committed over the length of their lifetime. All of that weighed on the shoulders, those swift, torn shoulders of our Savior. That's His love for you. And that's a love that God's called us to love one another. Saints, I'm telling you right now, I fall short of that. I don't want to. I desire to love you. And, and you know, It's not to say I don't love you. Of course I love you. You're my brothers and sisters. We have the same father. We may have different mothers, but we have the same heavenly father. right? And by virtue of that fact, I love you. You are dear. I I look at you and I see a child of God, his holy light shining through your eyes. That's precious. But by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And I ask, do, do we love our brother and sister in Christ the same way? If we do, 
that we're going to forgive them for any offense that they commit. We're not going to hold any grudges. We're not going to think poorly or even think the worst of them. We're going to bless them. We're going to pray for them. We're going to embrace them. We're going to help them in every way that we can. The body of Christ, that's the church. If, if, you, if you're hammering some nails into some wood and you accidentally hit the wrong nail, does, do, you, do you separate that finger and say, here, you go suffer all by yourself. I'm going over here. No. That finger stays connected and your whole body is, oh, oh, the whole body just hurts. You know, when I, when I get hurt like that, I don't know about you, but I get like the tingling down the spine into the legs. It's the whole, the whole body reacts, right? That's, that's the body of Christ. It's our love for one another. And this is free. I didn't have this in my notes, but it just occurred to me. Do you know that there's not one single member of your body, your fingers, your toes, your eyes, your nose, everything that you have, not one part of your body serves itself? Every part of your body serves the rest of the body. If I take a sharp piece of glass and I beam it at you and tell you right through your eye, what happens? Well, your eyelids shut, your head turns, your hand goes up, and your whole body is activated to, to protect that one member. Every part of your body serves all the rest of the body. There is one part of a body that can and does serve itself even to the expense of the rest of the body. It will kill off the rest of your body just to serve itself. And it's called cancer. And in the body of Christ, there can be the spiritual cancer of jealousy, strife, contention, hardness of heart. And we need to ask, the great physician, Jesus, to take the sharpness of his spiritual scalpel and cut deep into our hearts and cut all of those spiritual forms of cancer out of us and heal us. But this love of God, as I've said before, this is an inhuman love. This is an unearthly love. This is the love that is generated by the very heart of God for you and through you. This is the kind of love that God displayed, as I said, on that cross. And saints, we can't love each other from afar, right? I mean, we can call each other, we can text each other and express our love, but, you know, this kind of love needs up close and personal, face to face. And as a disciple, that's why church is a crucial part of our lives. Church is crucial to a disciple. We all know that during COVID, churches couldn't assemble, so we had to watch by video. And we received a blessing from the Word. You can't receive blessing from the Word and not get blessed. But there was that lack because we couldn't interact with one another. We couldn't have that fellowship. We couldn't see a brother or sister that's coming in stoop shouldered and long in the face and maybe some tears that's discouraged. We couldn't reach out to them and put our hand upon them or, or our arm around them and comfort and pray for them. It couldn't happen. It happens here. And that's why we need to be here. Amen? Is there anything else that Christ has called us to as his disciples? Oh, yes. This is a big one. Not that the others weren't, but woo, hold on to your hats. Put your safety belt on. Matthew 16, 24 and 25, Jesus then said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his own life, he's going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Uh, last week, Pastor Sonny taught on Mark chapter 10, verses 20, uh, 17 to 22, about the rich young ruler. And this young man followed all the commandments of God, at least to his own satisfaction, not to God's. 
not to God's, because he had an idol that he was not prepared to let go of. The scripture says in Mark chapter 10, verse 21 to 22, Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, so whatever you have, whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had great possessions. Or you could say, that those possessions had him. The true disciple will deny self, not esteem self, not pamper self, not exalt self, not promote or protect self, not love self or love others more than God. Another verse about being a disciple, Luke 14, 26 if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters. I notice it doesn't have in-laws in here. I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. I don't know. And yes, even his own life also, is said, Jesus says, he cannot be my disciple. It can't happen. Our love for God should be so powerfully passionate, right? So completely consuming that our love for anything or anyone else, including ourselves, looks like hate by comparison. You see, Jesus isn't calling us to hate people. I mean, he calls us to love our enemies, right? But what he's saying here is that our, our love for God should have no comparison. It, our love for God should be in a class all by itself. Uh, as we said before, Jesus does not want to be number one on a list of ten. He doesn't want that. He wants to be number one on a list of one. There, he's in a class by himself. We reserve the deepest and highest and, and most crucial part of our heart. We reserve that for Jesus. And it's, it's the truth, saints. It's not until... You love the Lord that way that you are able then to love others that same powerful way. So husbands, wives, love Jesus first. Even above your spouse. Fathers, mothers, love Jesus first. Children, love Jesus first. When you do that, your love for everyone else will be all the stronger for it. Hmm. The cross of Christ is where he died for us, where he purchased us with his own blood so that we would be delivered. We would be delivered, set free as slaves to sin, no longer bound by sin. We're liberated, we're free. The cross that Christ commands his disciples to bear enables us to die to our sinful selves and let the risen Christ live through us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Listen to what this says. Paul says to the church in Corinth, Do you not know that your body, your body, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? That happens when we're born again. The Holy Spirit comes and inhabits your body so that now you are a temple on two legs. You're a walking temple of God. That's the truth of it. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have of God, and you are not your own. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You were bought with a price. Therefore, because of that, because you were purchased, God owns you now, right? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. So, you don't call the shots in your life anymore. If you're a true disciple, you belong to God and Jesus calls the shots. And you know what? I'm glad for that. Because in my life before, when I was calling the shots, oh boy, what a mess that was. But when you make Jesus Lord, what you're doing is, Lord, 
I'm tired of living my life the way I want to. I'm making a mess of things. Would you be Lord and, and manage my life, direct my life, lead me in the right way, help me make the right decisions? Could you do that for me? And look at this universe. Look at how he's organized this with such power and beauty and majesty. The whole of creation is God's artistry. Beautiful. If he could do that, just think of what he could do in your life as you surrender all to him. So a true disciple is obedient and they are on the cross. Or I'm sorry, if a true disciple is obedient to the Lord, then they are on the cross and Jesus is on the throne of their heart. If a true disciple is not obedient, then Christ is on the cross and you are on the throne of your heart. There are two certain things about those who died on crosses. First, they died agonizingly slow deaths. No one ever died quickly on a cross. Secondly, they all died. There is a zero survival rate among those who are crucified. In Luke chapter 13, verse 23 to 24, then said one to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. That narrow gate is Jesus. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to God except by me, by me Jesus says. That's a narrow gate. It's narrow because there's only one way to heaven. It's also broad in that sense that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But to go through Jesus, you have to deny yourself. You have to deny your own life. You have to deny many, many things. So there's a striving in that sense to leave behind the old life and to press on and to enter in through Jesus into eternal life. That Greek word strive in the Greek is agon. It's the word that we get agony or agonize from. That's, that's the word strive. Also, two other references. 2 Timothy 4 and 1 Timothy 6. In both of them, I'll just read the verses. Paul there says, I am, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. This is what Paul the Apostle is saying. He's being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. Paul's about to die. He's going to be executed by beheading. So these final words are very potent words. And he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That word fought is agon, striving. 1 Timothy 6.12 it says, fight the good fight of faith. Same word, fight there, agon, to struggle. Agon is the root word for agonizomai, agonizomai. I practice the word at home, I'm messing it up. Anyway, to contend for a prize, to struggle, athletic contest or warfare. It's something that causes extreme stress and pain and agony. Any bodybuilder will tell you it hurts. When two soldiers are pitted against each other in mortal combat, and where death is as close as a razor-sharp knife, they will tell you it's painful. And this, saints, what we are in is a war. Your enemy is your own sin nature. You know, they have that expression, you are your own worst enemy. Well, that's true. That is true. Our sin nature is our worst enemy. And there can be no peace treaty allowed between a child of God and their sin nature. No compromise. There must be total annihilation. And on your part as a child of God, no surrender. You may suffer a thousand defeats, but by the power of Jesus Christ, when you call out to the Lord to empower you, you can rise up for those, from those 1,000 defeats and rise up and tell your sin nature and Satan, stand back. The victory of, is, of mine is in Christ. Amen. 
Paul realized that for Christ to live through him, he must die. Galatians 2.20. I, he says, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Well, physically, as I just said, he was beheaded. So he's obviously speaking in spiritual terms here. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in this body, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And remember, saints, remember this. I always talk about death and suffering and dying on the cross and all this stuff. You know, you might say, geez, James, can you be a little more positive? Okay, I'll be positive. I'm positive that you will be in pain and suffering and die the death on the cross. I'm sure that as a Christian, that's true. But beyond the cross, there is the resurrection. There is new life. There is empowerment to live godly and well-pleasing to the Father. Uh, Philippians 3.10 That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. I may be conformed unto His death. Amen? Amen. So that's, this is where we're, we're uh, coming to now. I just lost my place here. Please stand by. Okay, I did that, did that. That's the thing with these uh, technology, you know, board, uh, tablets. You touch it just the wrong way and it goes zing, and now you know where you are. Okay, here we go. What Jesus gave to us was not in part, but in whole. He gave it all on the cross out of love for us. Paul, in response to Christ and his love for the apostle, declared that he was poured out as a drink offering. So that not one drop was left that wasn't offered to Jesus. He gave it all. Sweet surrender. As we examine our lives, how much are we being poured out to Christ? What is it that remains in you that you desire to hang on to and keep for yourself? We heard before, he who seeks to save his life is going to lose it. But if you surrender and give your life for Jesus, you will find it. Life more abundant. Amen. So a true disciple will seek to empty themselves of all their wrongful desires, certainly any lusts and secret sins, but also they want to empty themselves of any plans, ambitions, goals, and, and surrender them to Christ for his approval. And if he approves, press on. If he doesn't, then those plans, objectives, goals should be abandoned, forsaken, deserted for the sake of Jesus. There's true freedom there. There's a song lyric I heard a long time ago. Uh, Don Francisco, I think, was his name. And the, the, the line in the song goes like this. Father, let your spirit flow inside me until all that will not praise you is undone. And I could change this line to, Father, let your spirit flow inside me until all that will not love you and serve you is undone. It's a, it's a paradoxical truth in the kingdom of God. It is. That if you truly want to find life, you have to give it up. Right? So let's recap what we have so far, and we're, we're about two-thirds of the way done. The rest of it is going to go quickly. What we have covered so far. A true disciple will share the gospel, and as they grow and mature themselves, they will make other disciples. They will read and study and obey the word of God. A true disciple will love the Lord and the brethren, just as Jesus does. A true disciple will lay down his life for his Lord and die to self on the cross that Christ will live through. So is there anything else that Christ calls us to do as his disciples? Prayer. Prayer is an essential part of discipleship. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was once asked, what's more important, reading the Bible or prayer? I love his answer. Charles said, well, what's more important, breathing in or breathing out? <laughs> yeah, there's your answer right there. 
But prayer is essential. The Lord Jesus called the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem the house of prayer. And how much more should your homes, your houses, be called houses of prayer? How much should this church, Shine Bright Church, be called a house of prayer? My, my spiritual mother, that was very faithful. My, my spiritual mother was not my, my biological mother. The Lord brought someone in, because I was the first one to get saved. So I had no one in my family to disciple me. But my spiritual mom, she, she did a really awesome job. And whenever, anytime I went over to her house, there was such a rest, such a peace. The Spirit of God was there. And you walk in there and it's like, ah, oh, it's just it, the peace of God. She was a praying woman. She was in sitting prayer. And you could tell it showed the perfume of Jesus was through that place because she spent time in the presence of Jesus in prayer. Jeff and I, uh, my husband Jeff and I, we have prayer every Saturday at 9.30. I know uh, Brother Albert and Sister Ruthie, they have uh, family prayer time. I would encourage you, all of you, if you don't already, set aside a time we can come together, parents and children, and pray together. If there's ever a time when we need to be a praying people and seeking God, it's today because it is getting dark fast and it's going to get a lot darker. And you're not always going to have a pastor to seek counsel from and to get comfort from. If persecution hits the way I believe it will, then we need to know how to seek the Lord and have the discipline to do so. We all know the prayer life of our Lord Jesus. Right? God the Son, the Son of Man, He prayed sometimes all night. Luke chapter 16, or chapter 6, verse 12 talks about that. All night. He spent all night in prayer. I haven't done that, but I've come close. I've come to spending an all night. Well, actually, no. Yes, I have. Now that I think of it, yeah. It was tough, but, you know, discipline, right? I have many books on prayer in my library. Prayers uh, a vital subject in, in various books written by Charles Spurgeon, Warren Wiersbe, Andrew Murray. They're all excellent. But the one that's my all-time favorite, above all the others, this one right here. He unbounds the complete work of prayer. You've got all eight of his books in one volume. And saints, I'll tell you something. I can read a page or two of that book and get so fired up and eager and just encouraged to get into prayer. I gotta put the book down and start praying because it's it's awesome. It's a very, very encouraging read. So Edward M. Bounds, E. M. Bounds. I found this on Amazon. You can if you want to look at it, you can come see me after and check it out. Awesome book. In fact, I gave that book to a couple spiritual sons in the faith of mine, and they're loving it. They're just getting so encouraged. So there's that. Um, it's been said you can do many things once you have prayed, but you could do nothing worthwhile until you have prayed. Chuck Missler was fond of saying, prayer is God's way of enlisting you into his plans. Hmm. Charles Spurgeon said, prayer is not so much about length, but about weight. I love that. And Martin Luther, <laughs> Work, work from morning until late at night. In fact, I have so much to do that I shall have to spend the first three hours in prayer. <laughs> and remember this too. Prayerlessness brings paralysis to the body of Christ. The book of Acts is a testimony of the Holy Spirit and the church and how they were always on the move, hand in hand, accomplishing great things for the kingdom of God. And the hands of the church were folded in prayer. The saints were all together at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came down upon them all and empowered them to boldly declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of them declared it eventually from their own crosses. 
There's accounts of the, uh, I think there's two of the apostles who were crucified, well three actually, from their own crosses throughout that agony. They were still declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church, a praying church, is unstoppable. A praying church is unstoppable because they are united by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31 and 32, we read about how they came together in prayer and there was a Holy Ghost earthquake. The place actually shook and they were full of the Holy Spirit and boldly declared the Word of God. And they were of one heart and one soul, it says. That is unity. That is what happens when we come together and seek God together in prayer. It's also been said, you can tell how loved a church is by how many attend Sunday service. You can tell how much the pastor is loved by how many attend the midweek service. And you can tell how much Jesus is loved by how many attend the prayer service. Ooh. Ouch. Does that pinch a little bit? Now, I'm sorry to say, saints, I say this in love, but it's the truth. And it's not just here at Sean Bright, it's just about everywhere. Uh, Pastor Sonny and, and Brother Ben will give the announcements every week. And every week they invite the fellowship to come and spend one day out of the month for a couple hours to come together and pray. And we get maybe 12, usually less than 10 of a church. And there's many people who are not here today. Now you could say, well, I mean, that's a church prayer meeting, you know? That's not my own personal private prayer life. Okay, but I'll tell you something. After 40 years as a Christian, I've, I've made some observations. And if I can use you, John, as an example, he was at the uh, prayer meeting last month, and the fervency and the zeal. I mean, he was sitting right next to me, and I thought my last name was fire, right? I mean, I was like getting heat off this guy. He, he was just consumed in just his prayer for Jesus, right? Someone like that, who's like that in their own private, personal prayer life, they hear about a prayer meeting, they're like, what? Where? They want to be there. If you have a strong prayer life in your personal life, then any chance you have of praying with the saints, you're going to go for it. So I would ask, again, in love, to examine your hearts. We have prayer meeting the last Saturday of every month. We start at 10 a.m. until noon. You think, that's two hours. I don't know if it lasts two hours. If you can't last two hours, if you can only be there for 30 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe an hour, if, and then you have to go, that's fine. That's fine. But I, I do suspect that once you start coming on a regular basis, 20 minutes isn't going to do it. You're going to want to be there for 30 minutes and then 40 and so on. Prayer is like a fire. You see someone's on fire in prayer, it, it's contagious. It catches. You, you start catching it. Right? But the words of Jesus haunt me. Luke 18, 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So may we, may, may, may he find faith among us here at Shine Bright. May we, by the grace of God, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And when we are doing all these things as disciples, what can we expect from our Father? Overflowing blessings to Christ and the tremendous honor of being used powerfully for His glory. And as we're doing these things, what can we expect from the world? <laughs> we're almost done, saints. Hang in there. What can we expect from the world as we truly follow Jesus as His disciples? John 15, beginning with verse 19, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But yet, because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore, the world hates you. 
Remember the word that is said to you. A servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, Jesus says, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my word, they will keep yours also. All right? But even here, hatred and persecution in the world, that still leads to blessing because what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? Blessed are you, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, make sure it's falsely, right? For my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. And saints, if Jesus says something that's great, you can believe it's great.